All right. Oh, a nice t-shirt, mate. It's for you, mate. Have a look at that. That's going to look ripper on the old YouTube. The merch now available. That's right. Links on the website. Link in description. That's right. Taters, mate. How you doing? Very good, man. Very good. Good to see nice you. Nice to see you. It's been a while. It's been almost two years. Has it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah, March will be two years since we uh, moved back from Van. Bloody hell. Well, I know I've spoken to you since, but um, congrats on the little one. Thank little you very Mateo, much. Isn't it? it is, mate. It's, um, That's cute. It's like I've been saying the, the past few people I've been like speaking to, it's very different having a kid compared to what you think it's, it's going to be. And I think only by becoming a father can you actually appreciate um, the whole process, which sounds stupid um, when you say it. Like, of course, only becoming a father would make you understand what like <laughs> yeah. becoming a father is like. But um, yeah, I guess being a girl dad is something unique even in that and, and obviously as well something that you can relate to. So. Yeah, I I was like pretty convinced at first that I wanted a boy. Yeah, <laughs> and then I, I was then I was like, oh no, I don't care. And then when I found out it was a girl, mate, I was so happy. It's um, I think I think most guys want boys just because you feel like for relatability, it'll just be easier because you, yeah. you know what it's like to be a boy, right? So it would make sense there. Yeah. Um, but I don't know about girls. Yeah, me either. <laughs> no idea, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, but at this stage, it's, I think it's all the same until they hit like 13 or 14, isn't it? Really? Yeah. And then maybe I'll be like, oh, damn, I got a girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, how is, how is Olivia and how's Lucy? How's the fan? Yeah, everyone's great. Uh, Lucy's at work right now. She uh, went back to work in May after her maternity leave. Um, and Olivia went into daycare soon after that, actually. Um, but yeah, she's good. She's like 16 months now, which is crazy. And she's like, she's literally running around like it's, yeah, she started, she took her first step at like nine months, which is the day we left the UK to come back here after our trip there. Um, and then ever since then, mate, she's like saying words now. She's saying no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, she's going to be a handful, but she's bloody lovely. Yeah, yeah, nice. Um, I can imagine that it happens quick. Like we're, I guess, six weeks in and it feels like it's gone in the blink of an eye. So I imagine like that doesn't change at all. No, it, that's the thing. Like thinking now, like you said, we haven't seen each other for two years. But then it's like, oh, it makes sense because Olivia's now 16 months. You know, soon she'd be 18 months, then two years. And yeah, the time does fly, fly past. I mean, how's your sleep right now for you and Kat? Uh, well, I guess very different depending on who you ask. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought, I thought, oh, I hate saying this. I thought it would be worse. Um, but I always think like as soon as I feel like oh, it's not too bad. It probably means that cats simply just like wearing more of the sleep deprivation front, right? Um, but we're still like exclusively breastfeeding. So I kind of, I guess, get a lid off on that, that for the most part, what can I do, you know? Um, although we have just started introducing a bottle at night, trying to like help with setting up like a bit of a bedtime routine and a bit of wind down, which like I'm happy to do. And I think, eventually we'll try to transition into that um you know let cat do a feed at 8 30 9 o'clock go to bed i can do a 10 30 11 o'clock feed and put matea down and hopefully cat ends up getting that sleep from eight till one or two and kind of going from there yeah. um that was kind of our plan as well it's it's more the um the frequency of like broken sleep more than it is like you spend like great lengths of time completely totally. yeah yeah, I totally get that. It was the same for us. It's like you just get to a point where you're getting some good REMs and then you're like, no, nope, time to get up. Um, I never had any idea as well how much noise kids make, like newborns make. I don't know if I thought they're either screaming 
or they're completely quiet, you know, they're crying or they're quiet, but she just like squeaks and chortles and snortles and, you know, like oh, really? yeah. nonstop. Um, but then she stops and goes quiet and I panic because like, she's still breathing. Oh yeah. That's scary. Right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah we're, we're still, she's obviously still in our room. So I think that'll be a, a big step even for us to, to move her into her own space and see how that goes. But I think that's still a couple of months away. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's game changing when like Olivia's right now is in our den and it's game changing. Like as soon as we did the sleep training thing, um, I was really worried about sleep training and then like we put her down for the first night of sleep training and she was like 15 minutes of crying and then to sleep. And then each night got progressively better for, since then. And then like there was some regressions and stuff, but like now she sleeps last night, she slept 12 hours, like without waking up. Beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's bloody lovely. <laughs> Things and then I ship her off to daycare. <laughs> um, it, it, it's funny. And, and I guess to, to start to segue towards some of the stuff I wanted to chat to you about. Um, I don't know, like, I'm guessing you probably felt this too, but the, the moment you have kids, it's a game changer in the sense of that leverage you have in terms of like what you want to do with, you know, with your life and what you want to achieve in, in order to not just provide, but to, to set examples and, um, and stuff like that. And I think it's no coincidence that, you know, watching, all the things that you know we talked about for the the greater part of two or three years about what you wanted to do with with coach taters you know really accelerate you know in the last 16 months definitely but again even more so right over the last six months of of covid so um, totally yeah do you want to do you want to give us a little bit of a um a recap an update um not everyone yeah. surprisingly not everyone out there knows you which i find super surprising but yeah. Well, I'll give a I'll give a brief overview of of my whole life right now. Um, so my name is Andy. My surname is Tate, hence the name of my business, which is Coach Taters. Um, I'm originally from the UK. I moved to Canada five years ago, which is how I know Cat and Ben. Um, and I left my office job in the UK to to move here, and I wanted to be a CrossFit coach and a personal trainer. And I was like, that's going to be my dream job here. And I was lucky enough to find something and kind of ease my way into the industry at, at that time. And then I kind of grew, grew a client base, grew um, my, my class coaching hours uh, to a point where it was like a full-time job. Um, and I always had this idea of I'd love to have an online business and I would love to be doing this kind of for more people and how can I have an Im more of an impact on, on people's lives? And uh, I've actually got an email that I sent to my, the person that ran my PT certification in the UK in 2013. And I was like, hey man, I've got this idea of this like online thing. I mean, it looks very different to kind of what I've got now as a business, but it's kind of the same idea, like an online coaching thing where I write workout programs for people, um, and now provide nutrition support as well. Um, and I just didn't do anything with it at that point. And I think mostly it's because it's so difficult to kind of get started for one, but then also like I did have that move to Canada and then it was like, okay, I'm working part-time as a PT and I got to get full-time hours. And so it was like going paycheck to paycheck a bit, you know, and, and just trying to build something up that's more secure before I go on to something else. And then once I did have that, of course, it was like procrastination um, and, and fear, I suppose, of starting something that you're unsure of and taking something on. And it is very daunting to do. And then, like you said about the, when you when you know you're having a child or when you've got a child, your kind of focus or your perspective changes a great deal. And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, because I, I remember we, you and I were talking about this, like from the, from the first week, you pretty much arrived in Canada. And then by the time you left, I hadn't really, I don't think I'd done anything except for I might have started a website and posted a few blog posts. Um, but I, um, I 
what happened was I was just, I really wanted to do this thing uh, and get this business started, like a, the online coaching. And, and then Lucy, Lucy got pregnant. And then I was just having that thought of like, Oh my God, like I, I can't even take care of myself, you know, let alone like take care of a baby and support a family, you know? And so that kind of kicked me up the ass. And I think like, yeah, that's definitely what kicked me up the ass to be honest. And then, um, I was actually traveling around the U S on uh, our baby moon, which is the last trip before you kind of have your baby. That's what it's called. I suppose people call it that. Uh, and Lucy and I were doing that and she was falling asleep most of the cut because we went on a road trip down to LA from Vancouver. And we would, Lucy kept falling asleep in the car. And it's like most of the time is in the car and like, she's pregnant. And, and so like, I just stuck on different podcasts and there was a few podcasts that I listened to uh, that were about fitness business and online fitness business. And then I was like listening to some and I was like, well, I could really do this if I, when we get back and knuckle down and kind of get things moving. Uh, and yeah, so to go from that point where I first bought my website or paid for my website back in February, 2019, when Lucy was pregnant to now, it's like, I'm, I'm surprised at how much I've actually achieved in that time frame, but it's been a big like roller coaster for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think sometimes we're quite similar in that you have that um, procrastination it's called procrastination by analysis or paralysis by analysis, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Get a good idea and you're like, yeah, I'm going to do it. That's a really good idea. And I could do it like this, but then you keep going, Oh, maybe I should do it like this or this. Oh fuck. And then it's like, Oh, it's not going to be perfect. Fuck it. I'm not. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Totally. It's yeah. It's, it's like to, to be quite honest with you. Um, even like I said, over the last six months, probably especially with, with everything that's been kind of going on with, with COVID and um, obviously I've been, you know, following you as a, as a friend for, since I've known you, but um, every time I see a coach haters post, like it, it makes me smile a little bit because I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, he's doing it. Look at him. Look at him go. <laughs> yeah, um, finally. Really just like doing it for the sake of doing it now. But I know that, you know, you've been spending extra time trying to like upskill um, in certain areas as well, which I think, you know, it hits home a little bit for us too. Like we have wanted to do heaps more multimedia stuff, but just have that like, oh, but I don't know how to use like iMovie, so therefore I'm just not going to do it. Um, yeah. And there's a, a little bit of like, you know, well, Taters is, is figuring it out. Like, <laughs> yeah. Taters can figure it out. Um, I mean that in the nicest possible way as well. No, it's great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's cool to see. I think you get to a point where, you know, maybe it is, you know, you get into your thirties or maybe it is having um, a family and, and having a partner and you get to that point where you start to really, you know, you, you appreciate the preciousness of time. Right. Um, and especially having a kid, all you want to do is spend more time with them. And it is when you look back now, you think about oh, 18 months, how much I've accomplished is a lot, but each day is like, yeah, if you find something that you can just give a little bit of time to, over 18 months when the time passes, it does all start to add up, right? Yeah, it does. But it's so difficult when you're in the midst of it and you feel like, you know, like I went from February, 2019. That's when I started putting out a couple blog posts um, on a website that was brand new to December of that same year. I didn't have any clients. And so I was working a lot on my, on my business and I didn't have any clients until January. And then it's kind of gradually picked up since then. And so it is really difficult when you're, you're going through it to kind of see that light at the end of the tunnel. And you don't know if what you're doing is going to pay off. You can just keep doing your best and keep, keep that consistency. But yeah, I can totally relate to what you say about analysis, paralysis by analysis. That's the way around it is yeah yeah and so i think one thing that i've really struggled with is just believing that i'm good enough to do it Mm -hmm. you know and 
like I think we've we've spoken about this before because I know I've kind of lent on f- to you for some advice in the past and like I'm I'm lucky to have Lucy who's like fully supportive um and like I'm just I'm the only one that's telling myself that you know no one has ever told me you're not good enough or like anything negative so I'm really lucky in that aspect but in my head I'm like oh, I'm not good enough to do this and so the biggest challenge for me in building a a business up is kind of just dealing with that more mental roller coaster, to be honest. Yeah. It's, um, I think that gets to a point where you accept that, uh, you have to go through periods of doing not great stuff in order to get better. And I don't mean like not great stuff, but that your best effort is going to, when you look back, look quite, you know, hopefully look pretty bad as opposed to where you work towards and, and where you end up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like if, if the first program you write is not going to be the best program you ever write and you, sh- you know, no. get better with every program. I think it's the same, even with the podcast. Like I know to get good at podcasting, I'm going to have to do at least a hundred hours of podcasting, but I have to get through that hundred hours to get to it. <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. oh, now it's improving. Yeah. And that's when you can be like, you know, you're, you want something to, you want to do something. You want that thing to happen. For example, your podcast and you keep telling yourself, Oh, you know, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. I don't have the right equipment or whatever. And so you kind of just put it off and put it off and put it off. But I try and remind myself, like, what would I tell my clients that are coming into like either a a weight loss or a, a some kind of journey that they want to go through it's like the the easiest thing to do or the best way to do it is to just start you know but it's so difficult to teach yourself that and hold yourself accountable to that sometimes yeah so much advice to take it right yeah yeah um yeah so obviously okay so we start getting into to the crux we start to get a little bit of momentum and then um the world gets turned on its head in, in March. Um, so yeah. you know, that, that was obviously there was a, a an element of, of trepidation there and, and, you know, some anxieties about how things would play out on that front. The gym shut, right? Yeah, that's right. That was, that was a really stressful time actually for a lot of people um, and myself included. And I, the gym shut on March the 16th and I was in kind of a peculiar situation because I had taken some parental leave for five weeks in Canada. We are entitled to five weeks as a parent to take parental leave on top of what the mother would take. And so I had taken that and that was supposed to be paid out by um, like government funds, I suppose by EI, they'd call it here. Um, And so that was, that was in January and February. And I still hadn't been paid out for that. And then the gym closes. And at the time, the government support that they're putting out for people that have lost their job due to this situation, it, I wasn't eligible to apply for. And so like, I was trying to call up, um, employment insurance, uh, like a couple times a week. Sometimes I was waiting on the phone for three hours just to get through to someone. I got through to someone once, accidentally hung up. Oh, mate, that was horrible. I had to call them back. So stressed. You know what I'm like when I get stressed, bloody hell. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was, that was a really difficult time to deal with those, to deal with that stress of not having a job. And at that point, like, I did have some clients, but, like, understandably, some of them also lost their jobs. Uh, and so there was kind of a rejig there in terms of, like, my client base. Um, and then, and then once I kind of got to know that I was going to be supported by the government and I was now eligible because they changed a few things, it was a big relief. Um, but then Lucy had to go back to work. Her maternity leave ended and Olivia was still at home. Uh, and that was, that was really difficult to kind of juggle any kind of work with that, to be honest. Cause like she would wake up and I'd try and get some work done when she sleeps. She was napping for about an hour and a half for two times a day, but mate, I was so tired. Like, yeah. um, but the things when it really started to 
take off for me in terms of like my business is when Olivia went back into daycare and the gym started to open up again. And that's when I had quite a few people reach out to me and say like, Hey, I've seen you posting a little bit on Instagram and like, I'm interested in, in going through some coaching because now the gym's open again, or, you know, like people did come out of COVID understandably feeling a little bit more self-conscious than they did going into it. You know, maybe they'd gained a few pounds uh, and they want to come out the other end and lose, lose a few pounds. Um, which like I said, is totally understandable. I gained about 15 pounds. So, um, yeah, I think that's what, in terms of like timing, that's when people started to like sign up a little more. Um, but yeah, it was like super stressful time. And now I'm back to work at the gym a few days a week. I don't coach CrossFit anymore. I'm just doing personal training. Uh, and then the online coaching. Yeah. It's funny how you've gone full, full circle, right? For, for moving to Vancouver with the, the dream job of just coaching CrossFit to, uh, to now, like you're just doing kind of a bit more like hypertrophy and I guess like the old school kind of gym bro training, right? Personally, um, which is interesting to see because you are very apt and able crossfitter. Like you probably, uh, you were annoying to train with because <laughs> you, you are, like- <laughs> yeah, very fit, very strong. Um, and I think it's it's interesting to you know you see you tend to see most people go the other way right um, come from yeah. Jimbo background into a little bit more performance oriented. It's interesting to see you know not necessarily go the other way. I guess incorporate more of of what elements CrossFit tends to to lack for the most part with with general application. Yeah, yeah, and. I do miss CrossFit. I haven't done it for over a year now. It's just over a year since I last did it because I last did a workout Cam West Games 2019, I suppose it was. Um, And I do miss it and I see people at the gym still doing it and I think, oh, I do miss the banter as well. Um, But what I found was that I just don't have the time or the mental capacity to do it right now. And there's always that under, for me anyway, there's that always underlying, there's always that underlying aspect of like, I want to look a little better. And I think that me just kind of shifting my, my uh, focus away from performance and towards aesthetic goals for a while, it just gave me a little bit of something new to focus on. Really. It was quite exciting to have that shift. Um, And And, say that again and plenty of content and plenty of content yeah the thing is like i could go and carry on doing crossfit but i'm so competitive with myself and other people of course i want to beat everyone you know filthy maggots i've put you in your bloody place right no i'm just kidding i'm just kidding but you are filthy maggots um but i i will just spend two or three hours at the gym training And I can't afford to do that because now I do have a family and now I do have like, I do need to put din dins on the tab or, you know what I mean? And so I'm just too competitive with myself and I would spend too long doing it. And I, with the hypertrophy training, I can just get in there, get a good pump, instant gratification, go home. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So it is different. Yeah. It's, it is funny, you know, again, to, to harp on, but you, your priorities do change, right? Once you do have a family. And I think the, the level of change, obviously, having a child is very different to the level of change that comes with even just having a relationship, you know? When you do have someone that's involved now that is completely dependent, um, it all of a sudden becomes less important, like, what your fran time is or what your max clean and jerk is, you know? And I think that... Um, yeah, you do like with any activity and, and, you know, when you set the clients too, it's, it's less about what the activity is and, and more about like the enjoyment they get from doing it. Right. Yeah. So if you are going to take that time away from family to spend in the gym, it makes sense that you would be doing something that you enjoy doing that makes it worth taking that time away from. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, as you were explaining that then, 
my head was thinking, yeah, no one cares what your Fran time is. Like no. you care what your Fran time is. And like, you can say that about the aesthetic goal too though. Right. Like, yeah, no, that's true. That is true. Um, but it's always nice to be massive. <laughs> Judy Dench, isn't it? So it was nice to be bloody Dame Judy Dench. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Tell us a little bit more, you know, like, again, I, like I feel from, you know, from what I've seen, um, you've definitely used COVID as a situation to, um, rather than seeing it as an obstacle so much, maybe you did initially in the beginning when there was a, a whole lot of initial stress, but, but more of like an opportunity, right? Um, yeah. Has it been, has the mindset for you been, all right, I've got more downtime. Let's try to be more productive with it. Here's a list of things that I've wanted to tick off. And I know that there are little things like using, I think you use like Adobe Illustrator and stuff like that. So to kind of like upskill, is that kind of being the mentality? Yep, definitely. And I, you know, I spent quite a bit of money over the last little while kind of investing in courses and using the time that I've got at home, especially when Olivia went into daycare in kind of learning those things. And I, I just thought, you know, I've got the time. I, I've got to use it because soon I'm going to have to go back to work. And like the more I can put in right now, I, I was almost trying to catch up for all the years that I was just talking about it. Yeah. You know, another th- difficult thing was like to go from having very short periods of time, like an hour and a half of work and just getting plugging away and getting it done to going from that to now Olivia's in daycare. I'm working only from home. I'm not back at the gym yet to having eight hours pretty much of like space to fill. And so that was a, that was a bit of a, an adjustment to kind of go from that strict time frame of an hour and a half, get your shit done, move on. And now it's like, okay, you've got eight hours. And so I found for a while, like that hour and a half was just filling in like an eight hour gap. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, I just, I learned that I need to be a lot more purposeful with my time, but I did a, uh, a, an Instagram course that went over Adobe Illustrator and I challenged myself to post every day on Instagram for 90 days. And I stopped after about 66 days um, because I was just so stressed about it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's the all or nothing mindset that I preach to my clients definitely need to have you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's the, social media is a funny one, right? Because like, I think one of the first things I have a lot of our new clients do is go through their social media and like remove like three quarters of, of the stuff that they're, you know, kind of being susceptible to the messaging too. And, um, yeah, sometimes I feel like the biggest hypocrite when it's like how much time we're kind of putting on like, putting content out there and delivering people and, and trying to boost engagement and you know, how that engagement helps us grow and helps us reach more people. And at the same time, time people like spend less time on social media. Right. So you kind of get caught in this like conundrum of like, I don't know, I guess we justified in that the information that we're trying to put out there is like information that's healthy, that's useful, that's reliable, that's responsible um, as a way of carrying all the other information that, that finds its way onto Instagram. Yeah, this is actually a bit of a hot topic right now for me because Lucy works in mental health. And so anything that I post on social media, she's always, you know, pushes me to have a think about some of the messages that might come across from certain things. And I've definitely had people unfollow me as a result of some of my posts. And it, I think it's good to think about like the mental aspect of what you're putting across and then how that's having an impact on people like mentally if they see that. And so, cause some people are triggered by, you know, weight loss terminology and I've been kind of, that's one thing that's actually been really stressing me out because I don't want to offend anyone and I don't want anyone to feel worse about themselves by the content that I put out. What I just feel like it's my responsibility to do is to help people with their goals 
and to stop them from buying into things like fit tea sales or, you know, juice cleanses or, you know, coffee up the arse, you know, <laughs> you know, there's all of these things that people kind of gravitate towards because they want to have that, that goal and they want it now. And it's not their fault for wanting that or to think that they, or to believing that even because there is so much on social media that's like, okay, lose 20 pounds in a week. Mm. Uh, and it's like people believe it and it upsets me, you know, that people believe that and people jump on that. And so everything that I'm trying to put out there is to kind of combat, combat that bad information that's out there. So you can feel good about yourself you can work towards having goals and achieving them and you can do it healthily. And so that's quite, that's what kind of what I find my purpose right now is trying to get that, that message across. Um, and so I like, like I said, I have had people unfollow me and I know that there's other people that follow me as well that are always waiting for a time to pounce on language that I use this, that, and the other, you know, um, I mean, have you experienced anything similar to that? Yeah, for sure. Like, I think you, it's again, when we talk about like paralysis by analysis, right? Like how long are you going to mull over the use of one or two words to the point where you just don't post anything and then you, you're potentially not helping a heap of people because you're afraid of offending one or two. Right. So I think that, that there's also, there's always going to be, cost benefit to, to any decision that you make. I think for us, um, what's been super good for this COVID time has been an opportunity to say, okay, what are the things that we stand for as a brand and, and what are the things that, that we want to perpetuate and what are the most important elements of this industry that we want to help promote? Um, and as long as everything that we do stems from an alignment to those values as a business, then I'm not worried about the repercussions because um, I feel like anything that is challenged, if it challenges all the way back to where it stems from and it stems from a good place, that's going to come out, you know? Um, yeah. Now, if we were trying to sell something that was bullshit and we got challenged on it, there's a, obviously that's, you know, very a very different line of conversation. But, um, and that's, that's not even to say that necessarily, again, like we said, looking back, you know, there's been things that we might have posted or directions that we might have gone that now looking back, I mean, there's programs I've written that I look back now and be like, I wouldn't approach that same situation the same way. But you've got kind of gained that from experience and, you know, and as you improve. So I think that first and foremost, like I'm not forcing anyone to follow Married Time Macros or the podcast or even me, right? Like if you're sick of, if like babies and gym, like aren't your thing, like don't follow me, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I think yeah. the same with the business. Like if the kind of community that we're trying to cultivate online and, and they're trying to, you know, the, the following we're trying to amass, like we want those people to be people who understand that like happiness and aesthetics is two different things. And that there's a lot of like mindfulness and self-awareness that comes into healthy relationships with food and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, if you want the 12 week abs, like this is not like, that's not what we do. Like, this is not the community for you. Why would you follow us so that you can, like, it doesn't make sense to me, you know? Yeah. Um, but I also think that there are plenty of people at the moment right now who are, you know, and maybe more so here in Melbourne where we're pretty locked down, but, um, but are at home and are bored. And it's just like, maybe I will just light a few fires to watch them burn just because it's something to do for the next two or three hours. So, I think you definitely get, um, hang on, mate. I'm going to pause just for a second. We've got a delivery here and the uh, dog's going to go nuts. Okay. Ready? Lazy dog. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Good girl. Um, yeah, so I think that, 
yeah, I, I think like you said, sometimes you feel, you know, that there are people willing to pounce, but I think at the same time, um, those people are, are few and far between. And I think, you know, the majority of people that follow you uh, know that your intention is not to offend, right? Um, mental health especially is a very interesting one. And, and we've had a couple of people on the podcast and I've sort of said straight up, like, to anyone who's about to listen to this, like understand, like my intention is not to offend. I know I'm completely ignorant to a lot of this stuff. That's why I'm doing this podcast to try to learn. And if someone's going to jump down your throat for not being an expert the first time you try to do something, like, like how is that conducive to creating an environment in any industry or topic where people can ask questions to learn to improve, right? Um, and I think that's the problem with social media in general is that you yeah. get like you know call out culture or like everyone's kind of looking for a scalp to show that they're more informed or like um, more accepting or whatever it is you know more than other people around them as a way to to peacock or to like big note or whatever it is um yeah i think like joe joe rogan says the best he's like just don't read the comments don't read the comments. Like there's no point because you're just going to get into it with like someone for no reason. And um, probably the biggest, the biggest step forward that I've made for social media in the last two weeks is deleting the Facebook app off my phone, you know? Um, and again, I think this is probably a lot to do with being in Melbourne and current political climate and stuff right now, but I'd just be like sitting on the couch with Matea. She's kind of gurgling away, kind of sleeping. And then I'd start scrolling Facebook and read like just something that just irks me and irritates me. And then I'm like sitting there with my daughter, like infuriated, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just like, why do I do this to myself? Like I could argue with this person for the next like three days, four days, whatever it is, but no one in the history of Facebook has ever commented on a post. Oh yeah. Really good point. I'm going to change my mind. Right. So why have the, why even bother? You know, it's easy just to like, again, remove or, or block or just, you know, like yeah. invite that kind of, but then you go down the trap of being too much in confirmation bias where all you do is surround yourself by people who agree with you. That doesn't make you right. Either, you know? so, no, totally. Yeah. There was uh, someone that posted something on, on one of my posts once and um, I was kind of like, Oh, you know what, why do you think that or whatever? And I ended up, changing the wording on one of my posts and then re, re reply to their comment and said, I've changed it. And then crickets, yeah. you know, like they're onto nothing. The, they're onto the next mate. Onto the next one. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, next person too, who's just trying to help out his local community and like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it is a tough one in terms of like having an online business and then not being online, you know, yeah. you know, you guys have got clients all over the world. And so you kind of have to be, you have to be online and, and to bring on new clients and get awareness for your brand. You, you know, you kind of need to have that presence. And so taking that shift of like, okay, I'm not so much a consumer as I am a creator. Um, of course I still flick away on like Instagram for too long, you know, but yeah. yeah, trying to tell myself, okay, I'm I'm trying to create content for people that's going to help and improve their lives and help them get to their goals rather than consuming content. I mean, that's kind of for us rather than for people that might be listening to this who are consumers of content. Um, so it might be, it might be different, but I know I've unfollowed a lot of people because I, s mostly like fitness coaches because I feel like, Oh my goodness, they've got this many followers and like, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm a terrible person, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you just kind of think you're not good enough. And that kind of backs up the idea of you when you have any kind of imposter syndrome and you, you see everyone else doing fantastic. And so I've certainly unfollowed people as a result of that. Yeah. Um, There's a Keanu Reeves, Keanu Reeves, yeah, quote, and he he's talking about rejection. And he goes, why would you be angry at someone for rejecting you when really, like, they've done you this big favour of, like, saving you, like, all that time and investment for, you know, for, for a poor outcome? And 
I think it's it's kind of the same there too, you know, like um, you don't want to be scared of people unfollowing you because all they're saying is like that they don't align with, with you know, your brand and what you're doing. And if that's the case, then like it's, it's probably for the best, you know? Totally, um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good way of, of putting it when, you, when you're trying to look at it as being a, a creator. And I think there's almost you kind of have to dance with the devil in, in order, you know, like we said, to, to provide a platform where there can be some reliable and trustworthy information that's being put out into the sphere. Um, yeah. Fortunately, it, it doesn't get nearly a shadow of the eyes that, that a lot of the bullshit gets, but you know, what do you do? Not fight the fight, right? Like put no content out there, put no like information out there for, for people who are willing to, to look for it, you know? Yeah. And one of the, courses that i did for instagram on their on their um one of their testimonials or case studies is oh this person sells fit tea and has grown their page to this much and makes this many million per year and i'm like are you serious like are you actually serious yeah it's like you're going to drink tea and then like i think i think the biggest difference is if you're wondering whether or not uh, a, a creator is worthy of like your regular attention, I think what you understand is there's a big difference between someone who is providing a product and someone who is providing a service. And generally speaking, if someone is providing a service, there's more likelihood that they actually care about the quality of that service because that's how they get repeat business. Right? So, um, for someone like yourself or someone like us, where our, our, you know, we are providing a long-term service. It's not I sell one tea and I move on and there's like 7 billion people in the world and I can sell tea for $2. So if I can sell it to, you know, um, if they buy five boxes, then I've got five times, you know what I mean? Like there's very much like that wipe your hands clean once you've sold the product mentality. Um, and I think there is obviously a little bit of crossover, like, I don't know about you, but there's a, a lot of people that used to be in my newsfeed that do like one bodybuilding show and, and all of a sudden they're you know, selling this supplement or that supplement or whatever else. And it's like one show is their testimonial to this product that they weren't even taking at the time. And, and now they're doing nutrition plans, right? To cookie cutter template sort of stuff. Like yeah. for us as well, it's, I guess it's easy to spot those a mile away. And I guess the good news is they tend not to last too long, right? Um, yeah. But you just feel for like, even if they only sell two or three plans, like is that that person's last ditch effort at health and fitness that has now like spent money to purchase something from someone who's not qualified, you know? And again, it's going to be something else that doesn't work. And what does that do to like their resilience or their ability to want to try again? Right. Yeah, totally. And that's when I find like where we come in and we can provide that, you know, you can, you can do this. You can support people in doing it in like a very sustainable way, but people do often come in thinking that they, they can't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, it's, it's somewhat upsetting, you know, and when I hear people, I'm going to do this diet and I'm going to do that diet. And in my mind, I'm thinking, Oh, please don't like, don't even try because you, you don't have to do this. You know, you don't have to do this. It's the self-awareness and the mindset stuff is kind of like, uh, you know, when you're PTing clients and you're trying to teach them how to breathe, right? And it, it, it's almost like um, sometimes you feel like it's so basic that, uh, or clients might feel that it's so basic that they don't know what they're actually paying for because they can't derive a benefit out of it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's that same thing sometimes when you sit down and talk to someone and say, hey, we need to work a little bit here on like your self-awareness and why you keep making these decisions. It's not the bang for, like they're, they're, it's not what they're paying for essentially. They don't understand that it's part of the process. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. The, the nuts and bolts on it. And I think correcting, you know, if you want content, like ideas for content, like correcting a lot of that um, terminology has been something we've been trying to do for the better part of two years. Like why why do you have an end date on your diet? That doesn't make sense to me, you know? Yeah, I saw you post, post that a couple of times, actually. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, because the, that, like we, you know, we have this kind of saying within our team that it's like we're trying to reclaim a lot of these terms. Um, understand that your diet is like everything you consume, messaging, social media, not just like food, right? Um, yeah. I, and I guess that's something as well that we've, we've kind of evolved over time. But um, yeah, man, social media is it's hard, super hard. And I think what's worked for us is worrying less about what we think people want us to post and worry more about what we know we should be posting about and trusting that we're going to attract the community. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and it's, it is difficult. And I found like... I can be, I, I, this 90 day challenge that I set for myself, that I stopped after 66. You know, I found like my engagement rate gradually got worse, like as I got further into it. And like, it might be because I was like on the day of my post, it's like I wasn't planned. And so I would just sit down and be like, oh, I've got to make a post. Like, what should I post about? Um, and I, I got worse engagement over time. But when someone would message me and say, that post was awesome or I resonated with that post. Someone would now and again say, Hey, I've really enjoyed the content you're putting out. That was kind of enough to be like, okay, if, if I can help one person per post, you know, and that's the end of the day, kind of what we want to do or what, what I want to do. I'm sure it's the same for you guys. It's just, you just want to like help, help people you know? it. yeah it. whether they're your clients or not you know to have someone tell you like hey that was a really helpful post i'm going to try that tomorrow with my training okay. you know it's like okay great that's awesome you know i'm not thrusting down your throat sign up with coach taters yeah you know but so <laughs> but here we go wallet <laughs> yeah, it's i think um when you when you begin to become a creator, when you begin to use Instagram from a business perspective, it's not the same as when you use Instagram from like a personal perspective. Like it's not, it's not an absent minded choice. It's actually becomes a chore. And maybe that's a, that's kind of helped in terms of being able to pull back from a lot of time that I was just wasting and spending on social media is that, I now look at Instagram more as like, that's a work thing. Like I need to make sure that Maggie has like these two or three posts that are going up or, um, you know, I need to make sure that when people are tagging us in their stories that, you know, we're making sure we're shouting them out and, and resharing and um, engaging on that. It's like, oh, that, that's work that I'm working now. This is work time. And I, I've tried to get better at like separating work time from family time. Um, and that's obviously having a kid is a pretty good way of expediting that process as well. Yeah. It's so difficult when you're in the habit of picking up your phone, clicking on an app, you know, and just not even thinking about it. Like suddenly your phone's in your hand and Instagram's open. Boom. Yeah. You know, it happens so often. And I, I do it and I try to think to myself, right, wake up first thing, no, no social media for like the first hour. And like, still, I grab my phone, you know, fucking one eye open, excuse me, one eye open, like scrolling. And I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Like, this isn't going to, I don't need to be doing this right now. It's not going to make my day any better by like opening Instagram at whatever time I get up, 5 a.m. 5 a.m. club. 5 a.m. club, isn't it? Um, one eye open club. You know, one thing, one thing that I've tried to do more of, especially since being in lockdown, is where Instagram used to be like in terms of prominence on my keypad is actually putting WhatsApp um, and starting to realize that what I'm looking for on, on Instagram is not necessarily like education, but it's connection with like people that I'm not able to see right now, you know? So if I look at the people that I engage with the most on social media, well, how about instead of doing that on Instagram, like I actually just send them a message on WhatsApp, you know? Um, Cause I think that, that having a conversation via that right where it is going to give you the connection you're after and more meaningful connection right like better connection than absent-mindedly like oh you know because there's always a, a part of like oh i see this person i'm friends with that person i'm gonna like that post and then like continue on to the next thing without even really thinking about what i've just engaged with right 
Except oh, yeah, I mean, Lucy tells me off because I, I'll, <laughs> yeah, when it's my post, obviously. <laughs> Lucy told me off the other day because I like liked a post and then carried on going. And she's like, you didn't even read the caption. And I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't. So I read the caption and then I was like, oh, shit, I should probably, I should probably write a, a comment. Because it was like one of those captions where you should probably say something because it's like someone maybe like struggling or something. Yeah. But you so totally like just go on it, click and move on. And so I think not only is it based like with you being locked down, but I think without lockdown, spending so much time on, on our phones, we are getting less social interaction as a whole. And so I think that leads to some kind of must lead to some kind of anxiety about like actually going out to see people and, you know, going to different events and, and, you know, actually hanging out with people in person. I know I felt that way. It's like, uh, cause I don't do CrossFit anymore. I feel a bit like, you know, I'm not in that community as much um, as, as I was. And like, it's, for me, it seems like all work and no play some like quite a lot of the time, but I feel like I don't want to see anyone sometimes. And I think that's because I do spend a lot of time on my phone. Um, but I do miss the banter. I do miss hanging out with people and I do miss um, like having, having those connections, but I think I'm kind of burnt out a little bit from spending so much time on my phone that, it's like i want to ha- i want friends but i don't want to hang out with anyone you know yeah it's weird feeling what's you know it, it's highlight real stuff too right and maybe there's an element of if i meet you in person there's a chance that i might say something that i don't mean or i might stumble and fall or whatever it is that's not this perfect polished like post that i've been able to draft and rewrite three times and throw a filter on you know um <laughs> It's sad to think that that maybe there are those feelings that I'm not sure that if I can hang out with my friends and not be this person that I project to be, you know, um, which is terrible, mate, isn't it? Really? Like, yeah. Well, everyone's going to find out what fakes we are, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and I think you, know, you, you only have a, a, you know, like things like decision fatigue, right? Like you only have a certain amount of uh, cognitive function over the course of the day. And if you're taking that and trying to divide that past a thousand followers, you're giving each of those thousand people only one one thousandth of that kind of cognitive ability. And that. so how, how deep a connection can you really give someone when you're spreading that attention over 999 other people? Um, yeah. It's, I think with lockdown too, a lot of people are struggling with having time to think, you know, and because we do become so addicted to being busy all the time, we're always in a rush and there's always a thousand things that that need to be done and, and kind of being forced to stop and sit down and actually listen to some of the thoughts that are going on can be super frustrating. I think with a lot of the, the things that we're seeing in, in Melbourne, especially with um, with a lot of the implications on mental health that we're seeing, there's a lot of that uh, that can be a confronting space to be in when you're confronted and you're on your own and you're isolated, right, to, to delve through why. Start asking those, like, super existential questions about, like, why you are the way you are and why things are important to you or, you know, you think about that one time in the eighth grade where you made an ass of yourself and it, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah, all those embarrassing thoughts. Yeah, that usually creep up at like 3 a.m. when you can't sleep. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's – and I, I think when you are, you know, the, the irony is the more you're feeling like that, then the more time you end up trying to distract yourself with social media and the more the cycle perpetuates that – you losing like the actual connection that you're really striving to, to try to get or find or maintain. You know? um, yeah. I do think that's true. Kind of what you say about like actually having time to process your thoughts is kind of just pushed, pushed aside by you opening your phone and going through and re-stimulating, you know, your mind and not having to process those thoughts that you've got kind of backing up. 
And so I do think it is good to kind of have that time where like you reflect on what you're, what you want and what you're trying to achieve and kind of what your goals and focuses are. Uh, and that's a difficult thing to do, especially at first. Like I remember when I, f- like I meditate now and again, and I re- recently just started trying again. And like the first few times I'm like sat there with my eyes closed, like you, in. Stop thinking. you know, <laughs> stop thinking, stop thinking, you know, so. Um, yeah. I thought, I thought I would see more of the, I don't know if I want to say like a rise of the entrepreneur, but I thought I would see more people uh, going out on a limb and trying to really kick project passion into like income over this time. Um, Cause I know, I know a lot of people who like do what I did and like work jobs that they hate um, and that they don't enjoy simply because it affords them a certain level of lifestyle that they do enjoy. Right. But there's also, we're in a time where none of those avenues of lifestyle are particularly available to you. So all you're left with is the job that you hate and the job that you despise. Um, so I thought that that would trigger a lot more of like, okay, what are my passions? What do I enjoy doing? How do I want to spend more of a time? And is there a way to monetize that hobby and that passion so that I can spend more time doing what I like to do and have it less feeling like work and less time doing what I'm forced to do and and don't enjoy. Um, And I guess that remains to be seen and and maybe there's more going on under the surface that will kind of come to fruition over the next few months. But I think that's why it is, you know, encouraging to, to chat with guys like yourself because it has been that opportunity to do that, you know, and I, there's nothing like a bit of instability from the job that you don't really like that gives you that kind of kick that, Hey, this could fail too. You know, like, the job you don't like isn't necessarily a safe option or a guarantee in any means. So if you're going to fail, maybe it's better to go down swinging, doing something you enjoy. Right. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, I think I was lucky to have kind of, a, I'd already started this by the time COVID came around. And so I was quite lucky in that sense that I did at least have something. I did have the ball rolling. And I think that, you know, for a lot of people, we don't really know what level of stress people are going through, even if we ask them, you know. And so I think that it's just been a very stressful time for a lot of people, maybe a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, depression. And so to think about like starting something at that time in, in your life is really difficult. Yeah. Um, and so you know what it's like. You kind of, like I said, I've been talking about this since 2013. And it's the same with kind of anyone that wants to any achieve any kind of fitness goal or any goal in really it's, you need to, you need to be fully ready, you know? Uh, and until that point, like you can think about it, but you need to, you need to, f- you need to really feel like something is possible and then kind of, and feel ready to take it on. You need to start to Right. Yeah. So you need to start, but you know, ready to start Ready to start. is what I'm, it's kind of what I'm getting at. And I'm, what I'm trying to say is, you know, yes, I have been able to do this through this lockdown, but you know, things in BC here have been pretty good. I did have the ball kind of already in motion and I feel like I'm very lucky in terms of timing wise that the gym started to open and people started looking for this kind of service. I do feel very grateful. That's the case. Like I've not posted once about sign up with me for whatever, um, through this time. And it's just been people reaching out to me saying, you know, they want to, they, they're interested basically. I think that's one thing that social media has helped me with a lot is people now know that I do this. Mm -hmm. And so it's just created that awareness of like, Oh, I'm, I'm someone that can help with, these certain goals um, and so it's helped me in that sense um yeah there was something else i was going to say but i can't remember we'll come back to you it's I funny too, there's i think when you start out you you're not so worried or we're not so much worried about um 
trying to think of the best way to word it. Like there's almost a fear of like, ah, uh, there's so many people out there, I guess, that, that do whatever I'm about to do so much better than I do. Like, I mean, I guess we've, we've covered like paralysis by analysis a lot, but I think the thing that's helped me a lot um, and professionally as well, right? Cause I think that, that we're all students and we're all teachers, um, but understanding and, and defining who I see as like the competition to our brand and to our business is not other people that are doing what I'm doing. It's not people out there that are working to try to have uh, improved health outcomes for their community. It's not people out there who are trying to improve like the general mindset and attitude and people's self-belief. It's the complete opposite, right? And so when I think about what is the, the competition's MTMM, it is the skinny tees and it is like the waist trainers and it is the eight week cookie cutter programs. And so I think when you start to realize that people like yourself, you know, that we're in this together and that we're on the same team and that there's so many people out there that need our help. Like it doesn't matter whether they come to me or come to you as long as they don't go to them, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that that kind of gives me um, that little bit of added emphasis where, you know, it's hard to go and do a workout alone, but it's when you've got someone to go and do a workout with that workout, it's not so daunting. Right. Um, yeah. There's a little bit of that, you know, get yeah, cool. I see Tate is posting. I see like he's up for the fight. Like awesome. Like, yeah. How, and maybe this podcast, like, how can we help? You know? Um, yeah. So, yeah. It is. Well, it's, yeah, good. what I was going to say is, first of all, I put my hands up and I say, like, I have fallen for many th of these things before myself. And so it's the experience of being going from like overweight growing up to being like to going through the taking these mistakes. It's like I can help you from my experiences figure out the best way for you to approach your a certain goal. Um, and so like, I, I want to say like, I've done it, you know, I, I remember when we, you were in Canada and I was doing intermittent fasting and I was like, Ben, this intermittent fasting thing, it's the one, you know? And like, you were like, yeah, you know, maybe it's just the fact that you're eating less calories, you know, that you're losing some weight. And I was like, this intermittent fasting thing is the one, you know? <laughs> And, you know, I still somewhat apply similar principles. I still sometimes skip breakfast if I'm like trying to lose a few pounds, but like, you know, really it, it's just, it's another one of these things that people fall into the trap of that I've made a mistake on. Um, but what I was going to say is when you mentioned earlier about how you see me posting every day and that encourages you to do something and it encourages you to push yourself into things that you feel uncomfortable doing. And I think that part of, part of kind of how we grow is kind of growing together with other people, seeing what other people are doing and seeing like you are fully capable of doing those same things, if not like more in, in a very different way, you know, everyone's got something different to, to teach um, or help or learn, you know? So I think it's good to have those other people to kind of grow with. Uh, that's why I think MTMM has done a great job with like the community aspect that you guys have got. Um, like everyone's in this together, just like the, the community is to like build sustainable health over the long term. And I think you guys have done a great job of that. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Um, there's something super comforting as well about uh, when you look at say someone like Ben Bergeron, right. Who like, Oh, he's such a, like esteemed coach and blah, blah, blah. And the things he says are so profound, but then I take a lot of comfort in, in sometimes thinking the only thing that separates me from Ben Bergeron is just that he's read more books than I have to this point. Right. But that there's nothing innately spectacular about Ben Bergeron. He wasn't born with this, like, super computer brain that has all this information input that I don't have access to. Right. And so I think that understanding that really the, the limit or not the limit, but the difference between like where you are and, and you know, the things that you aspire to be is, is kind of in your control. Um, and I think that it's yeah. funny that the more you talk to people, 
who are our age and the more that they're reading, like the more you kind of see they end up aspiring to be. It's almost like, it's like you don't know how much is possible until you, you know, continually have people to witness it from. And then once, once you see like someone else do it, like, oh, it's not so, it's obviously achievable. So if they can do it, why can't I, right? Like that's kind of what you're talking about. But um, Well, yeah, you just realize people are human. Yeah, you know, you kind of right. you look up to these people, and you're like, this person's superhuman. You know, he's one of a kind. You know, and it, you, everyone is fully capable of of achieving things. It's just literally putting your mind to it and focusing on it, and just consistently consistency over f- perfection, ain't mate? Put on a Bloody t- lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so good put it on a bloody t-shirt yeah and it, and it really is that you know like everything uh, like is achievable and that's one thing that i find is helped me it's like watching other people and uh like i'm in a mentorship group and sometimes i ask questions and i get the answers back and i'm like you know that's definitely achievable for me i can definitely do that and for so long i thought you know i'm not capable of making this business a you know, a profitable business. Um, and like you, you kind of have to get to a point where you do believe it's possible. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. Your perspective and your mindset is everything, right? Like, um, I am not the world's best nutritionist, right? Like there's a lot of things I don't know about nutrition, but for me, that's an opportunity to go and learn from people who do know more and understand that they too were once at a point in time where they didn't know what they know, but they went and sought the information out. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't even think I'm the most knowledgeable nutritionist in this house, but I have access to the person who is right. Mateo. Uh, yeah, Mateo, that's right. And she's gone the bodybuilding diet, made every two and a half, three hours. She wakes up, she gets her protein in. You know? That's right. Um, so I like I kind of take comfort. I, I think it would be super boring to to know it all. Like I had this question asked once, where it was like, "What could what could you do? What would you do if you knew you weren't going to fail? If you could do anything in the world, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail?" And it's almost like, what would be the point if you knew you couldn't fail? It, it'd be so boring, right? Like if if you were just the best at something without trying like how many people do you know are like super naturally gifted athletes and they just like do not care for athletics at all and you oh, oh what i would kill for your like potential or your like physique or your natural ability um and so i think that if you you know if you're waiting to be the world's most knowledgeable pt before you like start trying to like coach a client you're never going to get started you know um and i think that it, it's like I said, it's nice to have, and I know you're a big fan of like say fitness and, and stuff like that. And to have people who have knowledge that you don't have that are like, I haven't approached anyone to do a podcast who said no, you know, I've never approached someone to ask them questions about what they do, who isn't interested in talking to me about what that is that they specialize in. Um, and every, every topic you think of, every subject, everything that you even find remotely interesting there is someone in the world who is a leading expert on that subject matter. Um, and if you've dedicated your life to something like here we are, the two of us, like how much do you enjoy chatting about like training and diet, you know? Um, and so if you were the leading expert on someone and you had someone just who is interested in what you're interested in, as if you wouldn't want to share that, that knowledge with them. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that like you said, yeah, it's, it's perspective and, it, and it's mindset and, uh, you get to a point where, you know, you do believe you're capable of always getting better. And I think you find that happy place where you accept that you don't know everything, but that what you do know is enough to help people who know nothing. And that in the interim serves as a basis to continue to help give it. I used to, when we first started, you get nervous when you had a client that maybe had some, um, some conditions that you'd never, or parameters or challenges that you had never worked with before. And your first instinct is like, I don't know how to help this person. Right. Um, but I think you start to, to very quickly begin to see like, okay, I've never worked necessarily with this specifically, 
but I know that I can go and find information that is going to help this person and then that that experience with this person is going to help me if this ever comes up again with another client, right? Right. Yeah. And I don't think people expect us to know everything either, you know, and, um, but like, I think I've, I've expressed to people like, Hey, I don't specialize in this certain area, but you know, I'm willing to be there to support you through it and whatever you need. And I think that's the difference between kind of what we offer and, and a, 12 week cookie cutter program it's like you are there to hold their hand and find out a way to to get them to their goals you know work together with them to to achieve that and like i know for me it's like if someone comes to me i don't know about something you know i'll tell them like i don't specialize in this but i'll do everything i can to learn about it and apply it to help you you know and yeah that's kind of when you grow i suppose when you get that experience. Well, you, ha- you need challenge, right? You need to face adversity in order to grow and improve and get better. And if you're never challenged, I think would get, like I think even the, the types of clients that you work with, it's nice to have an array of different clients working towards different things so that it doesn't become repetitive and just like templated. And, you know, like it's nice to be challenged at times and to test yourself. Yeah. Many things. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Good. Agree. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. I agree with you, mate. Um, yeah. I, I would say for anyone, anyone out there listening that like wants to improve their life exponentially, all you need to do is start reading and it doesn't even matter what you read. It's like start reading. Uh, and read super wide until you find things that you enjoy reading on and then read super deep uh, into those things. Um, because there is a huge difference. I think, I don't know if it's especially guys, but I think there's a huge disconnect when you leave school and or university and the only things you've read for the last like, you know, 10 years or 15 years, your whole reading experience is what people are forcing down your throat and like forcing you to read and try to rote learn. And that's a very yeah. different experience to actually like reading or listening or watching something that you genuinely find interesting. Um, and once you find something interesting, the emotional connect there, like you retain it so much better. And once you've retained it and you can apply it and see it start to like come to fruition, like it's, there's nothing quite like that process. Um, and so, yeah, there's a, I think there's a, I think it's Navel, uh, what's his name? Navel Ran- Ranakeep, I think. And he's su- like super smart dude. He's on a couple of Joe Rogan episodes and his whole thing is like the conundrum of happiness. Uh, and he, his thing is like, like read what you love until you love to read basically. Um, but yeah, it's something that all these people that you do aspire to, to grow up and be like all have in common gives you that level headedness. It gives you that like difference of opinion, um, exposure to like different ideas. And I think that the yeah. more widely read you are as a person and the, the more your character develops, the more you're able to offer clients, relationships, your daughter, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And there was something that I think I shared it or you might have shared it. One of us definitely did. And it was a quote from James Clear, I believe, yeah. who was the author author of atomic habits and it was just saying like if you want to achieve something a certain goal or a habit that's what it was because that's what he specialized in if you want to achieve like a habit then join a community of some sort where that habit is the normal behavior yeah and one thing that i've done is like i'm i'm in a mentorship group actually with Syat fitness I'm in in his like fitness business coaching mentorship group. How is that? And kind of, it's great. Yeah, I really enjoy it. And having like everyone else in there, it will, we do certain challenges every month, uh, which could be like this month is article writing for the website. Uh, other ones have been like setting up a, an email list starting to send out emails every month there's a different challenge to work on um and i haven't done all the challenges just because 
time constraints and actually working with clients sometimes is priority obviously and having a baby but um just seeing everyone growing together is kind of coming back to what we said earlier about like you seeing me do something and you're like, Oh, I, maybe I should try and do something. You know, you see other people and you don't want to be left behind and you, you kind of inspired by how, how everyone else is doing. Um, and so I think that is definitely a great advice. And now I kind of, if there's something that I want to learn or something that I want to do, I'll try and find a Facebook group um, like I've just started getting into the personal yeah. finance a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You got to get off social media. But yeah. Let me tell you, that's, catch me in the Facebook groups. That's where you want to get a lot of personal finance uh, information from mate. Is Facebook groups. All right. Facebook groups. Yeah. <laughs> no, but there's like groups that are set up by people that are, um, financial advisors and that anyway, from, I graduated from Facebook university. <laughs> Yeah. No. Anyway, they're not courses, but you go on there and like, I'm like 33, got about 20 bucks in the account. And then there's people there that are like, yeah, I'm 25, got 5 million saved. Um, just wondering what I should do with it. And it's like, come on, man. But there's other people and it's like, okay, I can save a bit of money. I can save a bit of money. You know? I, I, I love James Clear. I reckon Atomic Habits, um, the thing I liked most about Atomic Habits was that it, it's given me a really coherent way to try to articulate where I emphasize a lot of my coaching style from um, the accumulation of like just trying to do something instead of doing nothing and understanding how compound interest applies across everything. Mm. Um, I think those are like, that is, and this is something here yeah, talk about, like I've been wanting to do like a couple of IGTV videos of like, top three like books to, to read to start like on track for life you want and things like that atomic habits is in every one of my top three lists when it comes to, to reading um and i actually sent him a message on instagram and i was like oh, i really like all your stuff and i run a podcast would you want to be on it so he's crossed um yeah but yeah it's um Like that, and I guess that sort of community aspect too. Like if you if you go to CrossFit, like that's the perfect example. Right? Like if you don't really like to work out, but you go and put yourself in a community where like working out and being healthy and having social occasions that don't necessarily surround like you know boozing on and and benders, then like um, that's a really good community to to be in. Yeah, where you can have health and fitness. Because so I think that's I think the tide is is starting to turn, but. I remember working corporate and like I was the butt of most jokes cause I had like my protein shake on my desk, you know? Um, and so it's like, there's an environment where like watching your health and, and trying to do things to, to better yourself is actually frowned upon. Like how far do you really think you're going to get in that environment? And I guess like the culmination of that story is you end up leaving the environment. Right. Yeah. Um, well, the amount of times people are like, you want some cake? And yeah. I'm like, I'm all right, actually. Oh, go on, live a little, you're square. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I appreciate it. And I do indulge in cake, um, but I'll save it for when I'm at home with my family and not like at work, Yeah, you know? Um, but yeah, kind of to be called out when you're in your workplace of like, you know, not eating something. That's the thing. You know, for be, like, for being of, healthy. A lot of people see self-improvement or your self-improvement as like a, th not a maybe not a threat, but like uh, an attack on them because they're not right. Like you're choosing. Yeah, totally. You like you're choosing to not drink makes me feel bad about drinking. So therefore I'm just going to give you shit about it. And I want yeah. you to know that I don't have to deal with that. That's, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. It's funny how much more terrifying that sort of stuff and, and all the social media kind of thing is like when you have kids, like the amount that it's changed and, and you know, no doubt it's done a, a lot of good, but there, I think the, the negative connotations associated with it, um, are starting to creep up more and more as we start to learn more about it. And as long as it's been around for more research to be done. 
And it is kind of terrifying to think of how far, you know, 10 years ago, there was no iPhone. Now look at like the impact of the iPhone on day-to-day life. Right. Yeah. And with same with social media, like where's it going to be in, in five or 10 years? Um, I couldn't imagine having a, a teenager now who's on Instagram and, and that sort of stuff and knowing some of like the mental health implications that they have from that. Cause it's like, we don't even have the tools yet as like parents or adults to, to use it safely. How are we going to teach the next generation that are even more like susceptible to, to messaging and right. So that's I guess scary. That's, uh, maybe that's another advocation for continuing to post and continue to try to grow our little cohort of like socially responsible creators. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's just a difficult one because you post on your timeline and of course no one wants to post anything negative or like where you're vu- really vulnerable and you know, it is a highlight reel. It's everyone's highlight reel and it's, so difficult not to get caught up in the comparison of yourself to those that you follow um so i don't really know what to say but it's yeah it's just so difficult and and there's there's something that we we need to do to not let that happen and not stop you from you know living your life i suppose what do you do? I, like, what's the answer, Taters? I'm asking you. Come on. People have been listening to us for an hour now. Come on, give them something. Give them the answer. You just got to get, you just gotta get off social media, get on them Facebook groups. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Um, I, guess the, I guess the answer is you try to have those conversations super early on and, and create an environment where you try to make it as understandable as possible that like social media is not real life and is the highlight reel. It's an interesting conundrum too, right? Because you, you say it's just the highlight reel and whatever else, but then someone will post something that's like not glossed over, not gore, like pretty dark. And it's like, Oh, that's just the play for attention. Right. So it's almost like, Oh, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Right. Like here's social media where like we're going to criticize you because all you're doing is putting up the good things. But at the same time, we want it to just be good things because we don't really want to deal with like the not so great things that are occurring with the community. You know, it's like this false yeah. you know, that we're trying to convince ourselves we live in. Like we said, like you said, while you're at home too anxious to go out and actually like meet your friends, lest they know that, you know, you have a hair out of place or you're not as shredded as you were in your display picture. Yeah. Guilty. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dad, bods but, for life. Dad bods for life, isn't it? Well, you know, I think that that's kind of it comes full circle because, you know, you kind of people that are posting might need some support. You know, if they're posting something where they are vulnerable and it is considered negative, you know, they obviously need some support but yet we don't have the same support system as we used to have when we were before phones were a thing and we would kind of speak to our friends or family about it. And I think like maybe we're just shying away from that a little bit more, uh, which is not good for mental health. I would say, you know, to not have a, a, have a, like a connection in person connection with people to be able to lean on them for, for advice and support when you need it the most. Yeah. It's going to be a sense. Yeah. It's a skill too, right? Like you need to learn how to talk to people face to face and look someone in the eye and shake their hands. And, you know, hopefully we're getting a handle on how much time is spent virtually and how little time is spent in reality. So that the next generation coming up, you know, that the art of conversation isn't a lost skill. I read this thing the other day. It was like, imagine if emojis are like hieroglyphics, right? Like in 2000 years, they're like pulling up like all these like emojis, wondering if like, that's really how people spoke to each other. Right? So. Yeah. That'd be funny. That'd be embarrassing for us, for our time. <laughs> You're like, uh, eggplants must have been a delicacy in uh in, like, yeah. <laughs> this timeline <laughs> and peaches 
Yeah, peaches. They're all vegetarians. Peaches and eggplants. Yeah. Um, yeah. Taters, mate. Good to catch up. Yeah, it was lovely, mate. Really good to chat. Thanks for, for making the time in between uh, Adobe Illustrated and um, having a 16-month-old. Well, I haven't posted in two weeks and 16-month-old is in bloody daycare. <laughs> but I've got to go and pick her up soon. So. Um, but, you know, you said you want to post on IGTV with your three top books. Yeah. So now you have to. I know. But you know okay, what? I'll, and- I'll probably end up just delaying the release of this podcast until I've done it. So then I oh yeah I'm going to post on social media right now great podcast with Ben he said he's going to post <laughs> three books uh, okay um, but I want to start YouTube as well and so uh, we've got to hold each other accountable yeah we actually should dude I know you're in a mentor mentor group but maybe we should make some time to sit down like once a month and, and kind of come up with a, these are my two things I'm going to do by the next time we chat yeah I'd love that actually like account, accountability buddy in it yeah, it is. Um, yeah, we'll have to get a have to get a photo of you in the MTMM t-shirt as well for the the thumbnail for the uh, podcast. You want me to you want to take one now, or you want me to take it after? Oh, you can take one after if you want. Yeah, well, do yeah. a few push-ups, highlight reel. <laughs> Got both. Yeah, the highlight reel. No, mate, um, dad bod for life, mate. So what's what's next? What's next for Coach Taters, mate? Like, well, I guess uh, as we kind of wrap up, like, what what does the future hold? What's what's the big goal you're working towards? What's your timeline? Um, if everything went the way it would go, what's things going to look like this time next year? Oh, this time next year, well, I would like to take on more clients and help more people. I'd like to be in a position where. I don't have to work in person because right now I'm, I kind of have to, I'd like to be in a position where I do it because I want to do it, you know, not because I have to do it. So I'd like to kind of grow. Uh, that's obviously a selfish, selfish goal of mine. Um, just cut that, that cut that in-person connection even further. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just want to reduce the amount of time that I spend talking to my clients <laughs> I'm all about spreadsheets, you know, just put, put, put a number on a spreadsheet and I'm good. Um, yeah. Um, but you know, I would like to actually take a bit of a step back from being so strict with social media. I know like I did that challenge and it was still a bit too much. And I think I'd like to spend a little bit more time on kind of some articles from my website, some long form of content articles from my website uh, YouTube and maybe even start my own podcast. Um, so it's all things that are quite scary, uh, but I, I'm not really sure long term what it's going to look like. I just want to keep doing what I'm doing and, and helping the people that kind of have trusted me up till now, you know, to to achieve their goals. And I'm getting some good feedback from people, uh, and people get making like great progress. And so. You know, what more can I ask for? Yeah. That's all you got to do, man, is just like keep doing your best and, and keep trying to do it from a good place. And I think that when that comes across in what you do and the level of care that you give, like you can't not succeed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And we just got to outlast all those just shit hacks that like don't have good intentions. I think that's what it, it comes down to. Right, like consistency over perfection, but consistency over long periods of time because the luster like of putting together all the work in to get things going and you know when you're looking at a two, three, four year slog, like if you're just doing it for the, the money, you're not gonna be able to like stay the course for all that long. Yeah. Hopefully. And I do think like unless the money the really- the instant gratification, giving up the instant gratification mindset of trying to achieve something very quickly. Uh, and that applies to whether you're trying to lose weight, gain weight, you know, move towards eating healthier, starting a business. It, it's the same principles apply. You're going to have to give something up in order to achieve what you want to achieve, whether that's time, whether that's money, whether that's, um, what else might it be? you know, you giving up calories, you know, for example. And so it's always going to take work 
to to get to that point uh, and it, you know it is just about the consistency you know the amount of days that went past when uh Olivia was a newborn and I would get like minimal amount of time to work on my business but you know I just kept going through all that that challenge and it's kind of come out the other end and it's it's kind of I can see it all paying off yeah yeah 10 minutes a day right whether it be reading or meditating or anything find 10 minutes a day and it seems like an insignificant amount at the time. It might be two or three pages that you read, but like eventually the book gets read, you know, eventually like yeah. it's developed. And, um, you kind of add that up into the time you'd be like sitting on the toilet playing on Instagram. Anyway, you can have all this sort of like stuff done that does align with more the, with the direction that you're trying to head. You know? Yeah. So. All right. Mate. All right, bro. Lovely to see you. Lovely to chat. Say good day to Lucy and to Olivia for me. I will. Lucy just got home, actually, so I'll tell her. And say hello to Kat and Matea. I will do. I think they'll be probably getting up shortly. Starting to hear some some squirming going on in the next room. So some rustles. Let's have some snortles. <laughs> A rattly nappy. I just changed A diaper. the podcast. Uh, nah, nappy. I would say nappy. Would you say nappy? Yeah. Nappy, yeah. I just did a diaper. Change so she should be good oh, okay yeah great all right then mate well it was a pleasure to chat and uh let's let's set up another call uh in i don't know two weeks or something that's good mate can't wait bloody lovely isn't it <laughs> thanks david all right mate see ya <laughs>